Welcome to Thriving with Stripes. I'm Dr. Patty Stott, along with Tom Stott here to present a positive environment for those with Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. With a grounded background in research, we're here to provide education, support, and empowerment to understand how to thrive as a zebra. Located outside the Denver metro area, we specialize in general consultations and health and wellness related appointments for those with EDS and related diagnoses. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back to Thriving with Stripes. My name is Tom Stott, sitting alongside, as usual, Dr. Patricia Stott. We have a couple amazing guests coming with us today. We have Dr. Dempsey and Dr. Afrin. Dr. Dempsey is a board-certified internist and diplomate of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine. She received her MD degree from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and her BS degree from Cornell University. She completed her internal medicine residency at New York University. In 2011, she founded Armonk Integrative Medicine, which has become a destination practice in Purchase, New York, focusing on complex, multi-system diseases. Dr. Dempsey is an expert in tick-borne infections, mast cell activation syndrome, and autoimmunity. And joining her today is Dr. Afrin. Dr. Afrin is a leading expert in mast cell activation syndrome. He is also the author of the top book, Never Bend Against Occam, Mast Cell Activation Disease and the Modern Epidemics of Chronic Illness and Medical Complexity. Dr. Afrin earned a BS in computer science at Clemson University and an MD at the Medical University of South Carolina. He has served on national panels on oncology education and speaks widely on mast cell activation syndrome. Both of you, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of what I know are very busy days. Thank you for having us. And then, absolutely, and for those that are unaware, and I'll kind of volley this question out there to to both or either of you, is what is a mast cell or what is mast cell activation disorder? Can you provide a brief summary of what those are and how they may present in the clinic? Um, Sure. A mast cell is a type of white blood cell. Um, It's one of the least common types of white blood cells, you'll find uh, far greater numbers of all the other types of white blood cells scattered about a person's body. Um, But the mast cells are an integral part of the immune system, Um, uh, just uh, essential to human health. Their job is to just kind of sit quietly, uh, scattered fairly sparsely about all the different tissues in the body, just sensing for any assaults upon the body. And as soon as they sense an assault, they swing into action by immediately uh, producing and releasing a a wide variety of very potent biochemical signals that we generically call mediators, the mast cell mediators that are released by the mast cells and diffuse out into the various tissues and signal other cells to um, uh, adjust their functioning as needed to help the body overall resist and recover from the assault. Um, And as long as the mast cells are normal and uh, functioning normally and producing and releasing the right mediators, the right amounts, right times, right durations, right places in the body, then that uh, helps us stay healthy but sometimes they start misbehaving and there can be a lot of reasons for that. And when they start releasing the wrong mediators, wrong amounts, wrong times, wrong durations, wrong places in the body, the other cells and tissues receiving those signals, they, they don't know they're getting the wrong signals. They're just biologically programmed to react in a particular way when a particular mediator comes at it. So the situation you get with a mast cell activation disorder is a situation with a lot of different tissues and and cells uh, and systems and organs throughout the body uh, 
reacting in ways they shouldn't be, doing things they shouldn't be. Um, and that doesn't help the body resist and recover from anything. It doesn't improve health. It just uh, subtracts from health. Um, when, when you have tissues in the body doing things they should not be doing. So that's the essence of a mast cell activation um, uh, disease. They're in general, we, we break that category down to a very rare type of mast cell disease called mastocytosis, in which you have not only the situation I just described, but also a grossly excessive number of mast cells. The mast cells are just proliferating out of control. It's kind of a cancer of mast cells, though fortunately in most of the fairly small number of people who have it, it tends to be a pretty slowly progressing cancer. And then there's the other type of mast cell activation disease that's um, far more common. Um, and that's a situation where you have the inappropriate activation of the mast cell. So in inappropriate production and release of the different mediators with relatively little excessive proliferation of the mast cells. So the increased numbers of mast cells is, is fairly modest, uh, not, nothing close to what you get in mastocytosis. And, and that disease, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS, uh, from what we've been learning in the last decade or so, seems to be far more prevalent than mastocytosis. I, I think of that and what you just said is it's almost like the, the person that maybe has a handful of drinks throughout the week, not knowing the cumulative effect of you know, that alcohol on the system overall, it's, it's almost just as dangerous as the other one in terms of chronic disease and, and long-term health, because a lot of these people don't even know they have it going on in the background, would you say? Well, especially since um, the profession of medicine didn't even start to understand the disease uh, that, that MCAS exists up until just about a decade ago, then I, I think we have to presume that the great majority of people who have the disease have not yet had it you know, recognized or definitively diagnosed. Um, you know, it's an educational issue. Um, come back in, I don't know, 50 years and, you know, every... Every health professional graduating from training will know about this disease, just like, you know, today they graduate knowing about hypertension and diabetes. But it's a complicated disease. That's a long, uh, that's a large part of why, in spite of all the smart doctors in the history of medicine, we didn't even start to recognize this disease exists up until just a decade ago. We've known about mastocytosis for about a century but we didn't start to understand that MCAS exists, even in spite of how common it is, uh, until just about a decade ago. And you say, you know, how common it is. What uh, are there current statistics on the prevalence right now in the general population? Uh, there are various uh, published estimates, but the one I feel is the most reliable, uh, supported by the best data, even though admittedly it still is a pretty small body of, of preliminary data, is suggesting this actually might be present in as much as one-sixth of the population, about 17%. That's a big percentage. <laughs> and... <laughs> That's a huge yeah. percentage. And on, on our end, we're not in necessarily a place to be able to test patients if we think that one of our clients might have something like mast cell activation syndrome. Um, so what are your current thoughts on testing? We've kind of heard the gamut of you know the very strict regimen of testing being done. Then we've also heard of some people that basically test by 
uh, actually taking the medication first and being prescribed antihistamines or even gastrochrome to see if that does anything for them. What are your opinions on testing and the process of getting somebody started? Um, I think I'll cede the floor to uh, Dr. Dempsey. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Afrin. Um, you know, I think I think it's important that patients get a formal diagnosis. I understand that at times it's not it's not possible. Um, lack of access to doctors who can test, um, financial reasons. There are lots of lots of ways I, I can see where testing might need to be. Um, I guess uh, not avoided, but but not able to. You know, there are some patients who would not be able to get the testing done for for these various reasons, and they need to be treated. You know, they need to get help, and I am all for that. But I would prefer to diagnose a patient because it opens up um, more specific treatment options, and it's a little bit more of a definitive course for them. So, you know, ideally, in the ideal world, they would get the the testing done and the testing could be you could make a diagnosis with blood sometimes it is that simple sometimes you need confirmation or you need additional information from urine testing and we can if you want more information about that we can provide that and sometimes you can get information from biopsy samples that are then um, stained with a with a particular type of stain that can identify mast cells in even old biopsy samples. It could be even ten years old if the if the pathology lab has them and you stain them with CD one seventeen and you see a certain number of mast cells and that can confirm the diagnosis. So it's not it's not difficult necessarily, um, but it can take some time depending on the patient. And so, you know, it does, you do need to dedicate um, some, some time effort and, and sometimes, um, you know, there, some of the tests are costly and some aren't, but again, the preference is to do the testing because again, you get a diagnosis that could be, that could be uh, then treated appropriately. There are, there are, practitioners who cannot test. And so these patients are seeing them and, and they can't go down that route. And so it's it's fair to, in those cases, to start something um, like an antihistamine to see what the response is. But I'm not sure that response to treatment is enough to make a definitive diagnosis. It is theoretically included in, in the diagnostic criteria that a response to treatment is part of the diagnosis. But um, I'm not. I'm not convinced that that's that's the best way to do it. Uh, but these there are lots of patients out there. If there's 17 percent of the population has this, there are a lot of patients out there who have this who don't have access to testing. So I think we have to, you know, understand that and figure out how to help them too. If I could add just two points, um, let me make clear that just because. 17% of the population might have this doesn't necessarily mean that all of them need to be diagnosed with it. It could easily be the case that uh, a significant proportion, perhaps even the lion's share of that 17%, have it fairly mildly and therefore may not gain anything significant by pursuing uh, you know, the complex and often expensive evaluation needed to be diagnosed with this. So let's not go thinking that um, everybody who has it necessarily has it bad enough that it needs to be diagnosed. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out to follow up on an excellent point that Dr. Dempsey uh, hinted at is that especially in these early days of medicine's recognition of the existence of this disease, it's very common for mast cell activation syndrome patients to have been chronically, mysteriously unwell for years to quite often several decades prior to diagnosis. And uh, quite often uh, with such persistent mysteries as to why they continue to be symptomatic uh, despite so much 
investigation being pursued and, and turning out to be negative and so many treatments being tried empirically and nothing really helping much, these patients often come to be uh, suspected of being psychosomatic or, or hypochondriacs. And so I think the point that Dr. Dempsey made about uh, the preference for making a definitive diagnosis is just crucial uh, to not only these patients, helping them to understand that, no, they're not crazy. There, there really is a, quote, real, unquote, disease at the root of their symptoms, but also to help their doctors understand that there is a real disease uh, at the root of this. So, yes, testing can be challenging, but I think there are uh, a lot of upsides to finally pinning down that this is what's at the uh, the root of the, the patient's troubles. I, I, I want to be clear, too. I'm certainly not saying that every chronically, mysteriously ill patient has MCAS at the root of it, but... Um, it is turning out that many of them and do. And that's a wonderful point. And I, I appreciate you saying that because we also, on our end, we deal with a lot of people that have a lot of um, longstanding, chronic, mysterious issues that might even go undiagnosed for a lifetime. And we've heard of people even that do symptomatically look like they have mast cell activation syndrome and the test potentially comes back negative. Can you touch on that at all as to why the test would come back negative? Uh, Dr. Dempsey, well, no, you want to why take don't you, Why don't you start that out and I'll add on to it. Sure. There actually, uh, the, 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 there actually are a lot of reasons, a lot of biological and logistical reasons why the um, testing might come back uh, negative. The, let, let's be real clear that even here in 2019, I mean, medical testing is decent, but it's not Star Trek. Uh, and furthermore, these are challenging tests. There, there's just no two ways uh, about it. Many of the uh, mediators that um, we go testing looking for abnormally elevated levels of these mediators uh, as an indicator of, of activation of the mast cells, many of these mediators have very short um, lifespans. Uh, some of them will persist at uh, room temperature or higher, like body temperature, for only a minute or so. And yet uh, the assays are specialized. Uh, most of the tests are not going to be run at the laboratory where the specimen is taken. The specimens will have to be shipped hundreds or thousands of miles, and if care is not taken at every step in the process to keep the specimens chilled, uh, it, you know, one could easily see a breakdown of these different mediators in the sample uh, during transport, and therefore what would ultimately be measured at the distantly located uh, reference laboratory would be a falsely low level. Um, so there are just a lot of challenges of doing this. And it's been, uh, you know, my experience that it's challenging enough that we need to keep in mind that a, a set of negative results or what appears to be negative results from one round of, of testing for this doesn't even begin to invalidate or refute or negate even a single element of the patient's history. You know, the patient's history is what it is. And if the history is uh, supportive of a diagnosis of mast cell activation, then there's a good chance there actually is mast cell activation, but we just have to recognize the challenges of the testing, and sometimes the tests need to be repeated. Sometimes we find there were errors in the 
handling of the specimen uh, by the patient or by the local uh, laboratory staff. And uh, those errors need to be corrected with a bit of education. And then we try again. Uh, let's also keep in mind, too, that the mast cell is already known to produce more than a thousand uh, different mediators. However, most of them are not presently measurable in the clinical laboratory. They're, they're measurable in the research laboratory. That's how we know they exist, but we can't measure them in the clinical laboratory. So of the minority of the mast cell mediators that we can measure in the clinical laboratory, the majority of those are not particularly specific to the mast cell. So, yes, the mast cell produces them, but so too do plenty of other types of cells. So even if we were to run those tests because they're available in the clinical laboratory, even if we were to run them and find elevated levels of those mediators, it would not tell us that it's necessarily the mast cells that are uh, releasing, uh, you know, producing and releasing excessive quantities of those mediators. So in the end, even though the mast cells are producing and releasing more than a thousand mediators, there are only about 10 that are measurable in the clinical laboratory and are relatively specific to the mast cell. But if you think about it, if you're only measuring 10 out of more than a thousand, right. the odds are overwhelming that the symptoms the patient is having uh, are coming about from excessive production and release of mediators other than the few that we're measuring. Clearly, what we're measuring is a terribly poor surrogate for the totality of the signaling chaos going on in this disease. It's just that at present, these 10, I mean, this is the best we can measure. So this is what we do. Uh, but absolutely. It's well, speaking of challenging that patient, that client that has been labeled the weird one, you know, after three decades of testing and uh, a lack of diagnosis, l looking back at that person's youth, and this is for the parents out there too. Are there signs that may be present in our young patients that, that may be overlooked, you know, something that may raise a red flag earlier on to point us in this direction? Would either of you say? Sure, I can, I can comment on that. Um, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Afrin can add to it. You know, um, the way I think of the way we think about mast cell activation syndrome and how it can manifest we know a lot of people think of it as um, the allergic type of reactions. Um, and so certainly mast cells are involved in the allergic-like phenomena. Some of these patients do have true allergy and some of them, and most of them do not. But the symptomatology can look like that allergic type where um, histamine is most likely involved there are other mediators, there's um, swelling of nasal passages, there's trouble breathing, there's hives, you know, the things that you classically see. And so in youth, there are certainly patients who look back and say, you know, I was an allergic type of kid. I remember reacting to, you know, to things, uh, either the seasons, or I remember having a medication that I reacted to and or whatever. And so you'll get that sort of history that sounds a bit suspicious. But mast cells, but I, I want to be clear because not all patients who have MCAS have allergic type phenomena. Many don't. They can manifest as an inflammatory type of um, symptomatology, and they can have they can have joint pain. They can have inflammation anywhere in the body because mast cells, as Dr. Afrin mentioned earlier, are everywhere in every organ and tissue, and so wherever they are releasing they're mediators, they're causing inflammation. And so there may be this, this uh, flavor of inflammation that you hear in their history as you take it. In addition, mast cells are involved in growth and development. And so if mast cells um, are activated and releasing mediators, they can contribute to abnormal growth and development. So these are the patients who have cysts and tumors and lumps and bumps and things that um, 
are are in various areas of their body. They could be in one area. They could be in many areas. But but that would be the flavor of abnormal growth and development. And so when we're taking the history, and and I started my history um, in utero of the patient. Um, so they often don't even know unless their parents have, the mother has told them, but what is happening, um, while they're in utero, um, and what their environment is like is going to impact their immune system and everything else. And so I start the history there and I walk all the way through all the way to the present. And so when you get the history in that way, you can start to see certain symptoms, certain flavors of, allergic type phenomena, inflammation, or aberrant growth and development over the course of their life that will help you to determine that, that you know, that's, this is a possible diagnosis and, and then obviously take you on the route, route to, uh, to testing and treatment. So that's how I, um, how I look at it. Okay, okay. great. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And we've heard talk of this primary versus secondary mast cell activation syndrome. Do either of you have any thoughts on that topic? Is there a difference between the two? Is there an actual line drawn between what primary versus secondary is? Well, I think there is a line in that secondary is a situation in which the the, the mast cells are evidencing activation, but it's clearly in reaction to some other process, some other disease. Whereas in the primary setting, it's the mast cells themselves that are fundamentally abnormal. They're dysfunctional. They're not normal mast cells reacting normally to some normal provocation, but they are fundamentally abnormal mast cells that are producing and releasing various mediators in an abnormal fashion, not only at a baseline state, uh, but also in abnormal reaction to various uh, provocations that ordinarily would not be expected to provoke uh, a mast cell. Um, The available research, uh, the limited preliminary research in this area strongly suggests that the disease is a primary disease in almost everybody who has it, uh, and that what appears to be driving it is any of a wide array of mutations in various mast cell regulatory genes in the dysfunctional mast cells. I mean, to be clear, these almost always are not inherited mutations, you know, congenital or inborn mutations. Rather, they are mutations which are acquired at various stages in a patient's life. Much the same as how, uh, much the same as is the case with the mutations that drive uh, cancer. It's just that in cancer, the mutations drive, you know, grossly excessive reproduction of the mutated cell, whereas in MCAS, the, uh, the acquired mutations are driving inappropriate activation. Um, of the cell. The problem is that uh, the very specialized genetic testing that's needed to detect these mutations, which by the way are not even in all of an MCAS patient's mast cells. They're they're just in a subset of the patient's mast cells. But the, the very specialized genetic testing needed to detect these mutations is presently available only in um, a limited number of research laboratories uh, around the world. There, there actually is no clinical laboratory uh, anywhere on the planet at present uh, that can detect uh, these mutations. But hopefully in the future, and who knows how long it'll take to get to this point, but hopefully in the future, the testing will shift from the technically uh, very challenging 
uh, mediator testing, you know, looking for elevated levels of the various mast cell mediators uh, that can be very tricky to pick up for various reasons, and that will hopefully shift to uh, genetically based testing, uh, which just from a technical perspective probably will be easier. But first, the, the, you know, the various clinical laboratories that do genetic sequencing, they're going to have to pick up uh, these specialized techniques from the research laboratories. So that almost goes to Dr. Testing. Dempsey's point about that young patient that kind of paints that broad stroke of inflammation throughout childhood and then bam, perhaps there's some significant traumatic event and then that gene gets expressed or that mutation is acquired and then it goes from there. Yeah, the overarching pattern of the disease is fairly similar between uh, youngsters and adults. It, 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 the disease is a chronic multi-system illness of general themes of inflammation. I mean, that, that's the universal constant uh, across all MCAS patients. They all have chronic multi-system inflammation and then plus minus allergic type issues, as Dr. Dempsey uh, described. Uh, many of them are uh, have allergies to various degrees, but actual anaphylaxis is only found in a minority of them. And then uh, there's another plus minus. And again, I'm saying plus minus on these issues because there are plenty of mast cell patients who don't have a speck of allergy to them, just like Dr. Dempsey said. And and then there's another plus minus on, on uh, re regarding the issues of uh, ab abnormal growth and development in assorted tissue. So it's the same overarching themes uh, across the entire uh, age uh, spectrum. But, you know, many doctors, they, they've just learned um, either formally or informally to dismiss um, a, a wide array of troubles of these types as insignificant. Um, and it's often difficult uh, in the press of a busy clinical practice to step uh, to, to be able to take the time to step back and look at the big picture of what's happening in a patient and recognize that this patient is having a good bit more in the way of inflammatory and allergic and you know tissue growth abnormality problems than the average patient uh, whether young or old and that perhaps there is something else going on in the patient that is kind of a unifying root uh, to the to, to most or all of the the more superficially appreciated problems in the patient. Makes sense. So we've had a few patients recently denied, and also some approved for IVIG. Uh, perhaps Dr. Dempsey, can you talk a bit about the use of this with MCAS and? Maybe how one might go about, you know, getting the insurance to help out. So just to be clear, um, I don't believe that IVIG is really a, a valid treatment for MCAS itself. So, so I would not use IVIG to treat MCAS. We have so many uh, other tools that we can use, so many other types of treatments, um, Excuse me, and there are some challenges to using IVIG. Um, the, the the reason why some MCAS patients need IVIG is for some other medical condition that might be related to the MCAS, but might warrant the use of IVIG. So, in those patients and you know who have let's say EDS and have MCAS, many of them have the trifecta and have autonomic dysfunction, dysautonomia. They might have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, like POTS. And if it's determined that it's likely an autoimmune-driven POTS, um, although I would argue that it will also be MCAS-driven, um, sometimes IVIG in those patients can be very helpful. 
Um, I'm still dealing with their MCAS. Uh, they still need to be treated, but sometimes treating the MCAS alone is not enough to control their POTS. So I might look into IVIG for those patients. Having said that, MCAS patients don't always tolerate IVIG very well. Um, it's not across the board. I certainly have MCAS patients um, who I'm treating you know, with IVIG who are doing very well. Um, I do have to control their MCAS, um, not just the way I normally do, but certainly as a pretreatment for IVIG and pre and post, I should say, um, to, to prevent it from kicking up the, the mast cells and causing more activation. Um, and then they can do quite well. But, um, but for many, even with all our best efforts, we cannot control their MCAS and they get very, they get very reactive. They feel worse. And in a sense, the IVIG backfires. Um, so I would I think about this very carefully when I look at IVIG with my patients. Um, they really have to be screened. These are the patients I would not take my most reactive patient and put them on IVIG because it's unlikely to be successful. But if I have an MCAS patient who who I feel that is better controlled, and yet they have these other conditions that that need to be treated um, and they need IVIG, then I'll go down that path, always looking at the MCAS and making sure that's controlled while they're getting the treatment. Now, having said all that, um, in terms of getting insurance coverage and all that, it's very, very difficult. I mean, they do need, you need to really prove that they have conditions that um, that warrant um, IVIG that are uh, thought of as, you know, uh, FDA approved indications. Um, you know, sometimes uh, there there's enough of a, of a similarity to the patient's condition to an FDA approved indication. So you can, you know, sort of work it and, and, and you know, educate uh, the insurance companies about why IVIG might be important. Um, but I will say that just generally, um, I'm using less IVIG in my practice um, mainly because not only because of the insurance issue, because that's, that, that is clearly a challenge, but because so many of my patients react. And again, thinking about the reaction and thinking about what IVIG is, IVIG is intravenous gamma globulin. Gamma globulins are antibodies that are pooled from lots of people. You know, when people donate blood, the blood is separated. The red the red cells are, are taken and, and given for transfusions to people who need blood. The rest of the plasma contains the antibodies. That's pooled and then used. Um, you know, various um, pharmaceutical companies are using the, that plasma and making IVIG. But the plasma, again, is pooled from many different people. And so there are many types of antibodies to many things, some we don't even know. And if we're introducing that, that into a patient whose mast cells are more reactive already just, just by nature of the disease, and you're giving that to them intravenously, um, you know, you're sort of setting them up for a possible reaction. That's why everything has to be done very, very carefully in these patients. Um, so I hope that I hope that explains the issue. No, that's IVIG. great. And it, it's really helpful. And it makes a lot of sense. And we brought it up because what we've seen on our end, and we don't prescribe this stuff, but we work with a lot of people that have IVIG, and we see either one end of the spectrum, they either do okay, or they do very poorly. So I appreciate the information because that's, that's what we see on our end. And then a follow up question to that is, how long do these people stay on IVIG until you say, you know what, it's not working? Yeah, again, it's very variable. Um, if you know they try once and they have an anaphylactic reaction, I, you know I'm not going to be keen to to doing it again. Um, if they have some reactivity and we're working on controlling it and they want to try it again, we might look at trying a different brand because we know that there are lots of fillers um, and excipients that are used in the production of IVIG and each pharmaceutical company and each brand, each particular brand of IVIG is made a little differently. And so it could be that the reactivity is not just to the antibodies, but also to the excipients. And so sometimes we have to change brands and, and try it a different way. And sometimes we have to give smaller dosages and see if that helps. Sometimes we have to give steroids or Benadryl or, you know, again, there's so many different ways to do it. So, you know, how long do you do it for? It depends on how, how 
how much you think that patient really needs the IVIG. And, um, but, you know, certainly if, you know, after a few treatments, it's clear that the patient is getting worse, I would not continue. I would not, you know, push that patient any further because there has to be another way to do it. And, and, um, and in most cases, in most diagnoses, there are other ways to treat it. IVIG has been shown in a few cases to be um, the standard of care uh, for that disease, but there are plenty of other treatments for most other diseases that are used, that IVIG is used for. Great. And in talking about treatment, if you have somebody that comes into your clinic and is standing in front of you and is showing symptoms all over the place, you know, multi-systemic, then where do you start treatment? Do you do a generalized treatment first? Do you localize treatment with medications? How do you approach a patient that might have so many different things going on? Dr. Afrin, you want to answer that? Um, I can take a first crack at it. Um, uh, then I certainly welcome <laughs> your, your comments. Um, look, it, it's a highly variable disease from one patient to the next. And it's my fond hope that we will eventually get to the point with more sophisticated, probably genetic-based testing, that we will ultimately learn to distinguish one variant of the disease from another from another, and that um, genetic information and and other specialized uh, testing results will help inform us um, as to which treatments are most likely going to help which mast cell patients. But unfortunately, at present, uh, we really don't have any studies at all which can help make such predictions. Um, And a lot of the treatment, most of the treatment of an MCAS patient at present is much more clinical art than science. Um, I I describe to my patients uh, uh, three kind of general steps in treating this. Step one being to, well, first of all, even before I describe steps in treating this, I explain to my patients the very important principles in treating such a complex and variable disease. I explain to them the need for the patient and the treating doctor to put forth a lot of patience and persistence and a very methodical approach in stepping through uh, the trials of the different treatments for this disease, uh, stepping through the different trials one at a time as much as is possible for the simple reason the moment either the patient or the doctor starts making two or more changes in the regimen, around the same time and the patient gets either better or or worse, you're just not going to know which treatment, uh, which change in the regimen is actually making them better or worse. And it's a real mess to sort it out at that point. Now, obviously, everybody in life from time to time faces emergencies where they've got no choice. They and their doctor have no choice but to make multiple changes in the regimen around the same time. I mean, that's life and you deal with it. But as much as is possible, a mast cell patient and his or her doctor, uh, they've got to have the patience to try to make one change uh, at a time. And fortunately, almost every drug that makes sense to try for this disease, uh, it only takes about a month to figure out whether it's going to be of significant benefit to the patient uh, or not. If they follow up with the doctor a month or two into trying a new drug and the best they can tell the doctor at that point is they maybe feel a little bit better, well, in general, that's not nearly good enough to warrant keeping that drug in the regimen for the rest of the patient's life. And those drugs need to be ditched and you move on and try something else. Uh, You know, when the patient and the doctor together stumble across the particular drugs, uh, that is the particular molecules that happen to be the right molecular keys 
for fitting into the particular molecular lock that is the individual patient's particular variant of this very complex, highly variable disease. They usually come back in just a month or two, and the doctor walks in the exam room, and it's immediately evident that at least some of the patient's symptoms are substantially improved. So those are the keepers. Um, everything else uh, we ditch and we move on. So those are the principles of this patients, persistence, and a methodical approach. And then the steps I describe to my patients in treating this. Step one actually is no drug at all. Step one is to identify the triggers of the patient's uh, dysfunctional mast cells as precisely as one can and then do one's best to avoid them for the simple reason that it's kind of hard for any drugs to gain good sustained control over dysfunctional mast cells uh, when the patient is simultaneously and and persistently ingesting or otherwise exposing himself or herself to to a trigger I mean, over time, as they come to gain better control over the disease, it's possible they may regain some measure of tolerance for things which previously had become intolerable, but that's over time. So to begin with, identify the triggers as best as possible and avoid them as best as possible. I understand all the challenges in doing this, but Nevertheless, you, it, it's just difficult to deny the primacy, uh, the primacy of, of step one. Uh, step two, uh, in general, for most patients, uh, I mean, obviously, there are always going to be exceptions, but for most patients, step two is to identify their optimal antihistamine regimen. And, and for most mast cell patients, that usually means a combination of a histamine uh, type H1 receptor blocker together with a uh, histamine uh, receptor type H2 blocker. Uh, the two of them together often achieve better control of mast cell activation uh, than either one alone. And uh, sometimes it does take a good bit of tinkering uh, trials of of the various available H1 blockers and the various available H2 blockers until you find the particular H1 and the particular H2, which will best serve the individual patient. And then steps three through N are to try, 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 and then try some more. The Many, 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 uh, fortunately, great many other drugs which have been found helpful in various mast cell patients. As a doctor becomes more experienced in managing the disease, he's probably going to begin to uh, he's probably going to begin to pick up some sense of which drugs tend to be helpful for dealing with particular types of issues in uh, different types of mast cell patients. But we just need to be really clear that that's all a uh, slowly acquired clinical art. It would be a whole lot better if we could depend on proven published science and research. But uh, again, we're, we're just far too early in our understanding of this disease to have any reasonable expectations that these studies are already going to be out there, and, and the fact is they're not. So I'm sure it'll all come in time, but for right now, it's, it's a lot of art in trying to identify which drug uh, is... Uh, going to be best no, that's, to that's try great. And next I really much so the appreciate the, the positivity and the painting the picture that, look, this is going to be a long-term project so that right up front, the patient understands that it's going to be some work. And to have, I think that expectation is important, especially for the person that's been given a bunch of one-off drugs throughout their life that's supposed to be the golden ticket. And now nah, this one's going to help out and kind of having that understanding. But outside of medication, um, in that positivity, that, that positive mental attitude and outlook, anything that, that you also recommend to somebody that's possibly dealing with MCAS, maybe really low grade aerobic, you know, work walking for mitochondrial restoration, anything, 
uh, yoga, guided meditation? Um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, everything has to be individualized. You know, Dr. Afrin just, you know, explained it in, 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 in a beautiful way, you know, how you know, involved the process is, but how many options there are. So there is a lot of hope. Um, many patients want to look at other ways outside of medication and even outside of nutraceuticals. Um, and so lifestyle um, is, is really uh, critical um, on, on many levels. Um, many of these patients, if, you're, if they're very sick, they're not going to be able to walk. Ultimately, that's the, our goal. Our goal is to increase their activity level um, and to increase their quality of life. But very often in the beginning, you know, many patients who are very ill are, are homebound. So, um, you know, we start with, uh, with baby steps. I love uh, meditation and guided meditation. It works for some patients. Some patients don't have the patience to meditate. They don't know how to. They're, um, they're overwhelmed with the process. Um, so, you know, it's certainly an option, but it's not the only thing. Um, I'm, I really, um, am very impressed with, um, there are several programs out there that, that look at, um, retraining the brain, so to speak. And, and one program in particular is, uh, called DNRS, Dynamic Neural Retraining, um, System. And, um, it's a real powerful tool that, um, that some patients seem to have, you know, really good results with. Um, not everyone is going to have, you know, the best results with it. But having said that, this is one 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 program that that I'm seeing more and more positivities and more uh, and patients are are encouraged by it. Um, it is a program that can they can go online. I think they can purchase it. Um, they can purchase the CD ROMs. They can do an online course, but it's a course. So it's what, what's nice about it compared to let's say meditation is that it's a little bit more, um, regimented and, uh, patients feel that they're more likely to, to follow through with it because it's a course and they have to commit certain amount of time to doing it. But it's really, um, um, the, the focus is the, the limbic system and it's really looking at, um, rewiring um, the brain and the limbic system, which is um, most definitely playing a role um, in MCAS. And so it's sort of controlling those emotions and controlling how um, the body perceives those, those emotions that can help um, patients' reactivity. And I've, I've seen patients who could only eat five foods because of, the, of their level of reactivity go to eating all foods and having no reactivity after doing a program such as that. Um, I understand there's a similar program. Uh, I think it's called the Gupta program. I don't know as much about it, but I've also been hearing from some patients that, you know, that they've seen some, some results, some great results with that. So I always encourage patients to, to explore and to think about other ways to deal with, you know, their life. So medication and even supplements is, is in a way, I look at it as it could be a Band-Aid, okay? It, it's dealing with the mast cell and that has to be done. But um, we have so many triggers in the world around us. And if you think about step one of what Dr. Afrin was talking about, it's eliminating triggers. And for some, it's emotions. For some, it's a moldy home. And for some, it's uh, uh, infections that they've been exposed to, and and for some it's trauma, and dealing with all those things are ultimately what's going to help. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to, and they are insistent that they just can't work on anything. They're not healthy enough to be able to cook for themselves, or they don't know what their triggers are food wise. Um, physically, they can't do anything, and you know, just like you're saying, we always tell them there's something that you can work on, especially this neural retraining that is working for so many people. And I haven't heard of the DNRS, so I'm definitely going to have to look that up in the Gupta program. Um, this sounds really interesting. Thank you. Yep. And one of the things that, that I have brought up to me a lot and I've explored myself is histamine. And I know there's a lot of histamine hype that's out there for those that have MCAS. And there are many people that really try to avoid all histamine. Do you have any comments on how that seems to help or maybe doesn't help somebody that is dealing with an overall systemic issue and not necessarily just histamine? Well, again, it's it's highly individualized. There clearly are some 
MCAS patients who are more sensitive to the histamine level in their uh, bodies than other uh, MCAS patients. Um, as a result, there are some patients who find that various measures to reduce uh, the circulating histamine load in their bodies is helpful. Um, plenty of other patients who find such maneuvers uh, to be of no help at all. Um, so again, highly individualized. Not no, not that's sure perfect. I that's that's definitely something that I'd, I'd love to get the point that. across that everything is very individualized for really everything out there. Yeah, and I will just add to that and say that, um, you know, I'm I'm working on these patients in an integrative way. So I'm always looking at their diet and their lifestyle and, and things like that. And, and many patients, you know, come to me having done some research about the low histamine diet. And some patients will say that there's an improvement. Some patients will say there's no improvement. Um, but I do do think it's important to look at all aspects of the diet. It may not be a low histamine diet that's going to do it, but often there are triggers in the diet that may not actually be that obvious. They may not be the thing that the patient is reacting to immediately, but it's something that is inflammatory to them. And um, so I do encourage to some extent, some elim elimination diets for the right patient we sometimes do recommend lower histamine or lower salicylate or whatever, but there's no one size fits all. And yeah, that great. I no, that's I, I appreciate the support in that because I can't stress enough to when I work with somebody how individualized everything is. And there are so many triggers out there for everybody. Everybody is so very different with diet. So that's perfect. Thank you. So what about the person that thinks that they might have MCAS? But the doctor is not necessarily a believer of the condition, the doctor they're currently seeing. Any advice for that individual of what they should do, who they should see, uh, how fast they can get an appointment with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry to be blunt about it, um, but if the doctor they're presently working with uh, is not going to be helpful, then find yeah. another doctor. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I don't mean to sound nonchalant about it. I realize the effort and the expense and other resources that are involved in uh, testing the waters, so to speak, with another doctor. But nevertheless, that's what the patient is ultimately going to need. Even if the patient travels, uh, you know, a, a good bit to consult an experienced specialist in this area who might be able to help them achieve the diagnosis. Nevertheless, uh, it's very difficult, if not uh, impossible for various reasons, for a patient to be personally treated by a distantly located doctor. So the consulting specialist more likely is going to be able to provide a number of recommendations for treatment, but it's still going to be a local doctor who's going to be implementing those recommendations and issuing prescriptions for the various uh, prescription treatments that ought to be tried. So in the end, the patient is still going to need a local doctor who, even if that local doctor is not already familiar with the disease, nevertheless, uh, the, the doctor needs to be willing to learn about this and willing to at least try to help the patient deal with it. And I, I do appreciate that uh, such doctors probably are in the minority, but it's also been my experience that for most patients, kind of regardless of what country they live in or whether they're in an urban or a suburban or rural location, if they're sufficiently diligent with trying the various doctors in the area, they're usually able to identify some doctor 
it is willing to learn and willing to try. And of course, the benefit to that doctor uh, is that once he comes to understand what MCAS looks and smells and feels like, so to speak, he's probably going to quickly begin recognizing the presence of the disease and a number of his other chronic, mysteriously ill uh, patients. And at that point, he's gained the tools to diagnose and treat the disease, and he can start helping a number of his other uh, patients who previously were probably. I think that goes to your point as well about the continued education uh, of our, our medical community and how you're going to get men and women coming out that will just know more about it and will be on the lookout for it and aware of it and not just happening across these patients, but that will actually have some tools in the toolkit to use to help them out. And I'd like to present a little bit of a scenario and not to specifically call any practitioners out, um, but we've had a few um, that I've seen and talked to in, you know, not necessarily in the local area where I am, but they are seeing a doctor that specializes in mast cell activation syndrome. And partway through their treatment, they're now being told that that's not what they have. And their whole plan of care is now being changed because it seems like what was being done was not working. Even though they had positive tests previously from other doctors that showed this mast cell activation syndrome in um, the urinalysis or the other tests that were done. So, I guess it's a very broad statement I'm making, but is there any suggestion for even the medical practitioner that is almost going back on the original diagnosis or for that patient that thought they had somebody and is now very lost? I know that you said to find a a doctor in the area, but, you know, these are, and this is not necessarily one practitioner. I've heard this from a number of different patients. Do you have any even support to give these patients or practitioners on what to do? Yeah. Well, just a couple of comments, and then uh, I, I absolutely invite uh, some words from Dr. Dempsey on the subject. Number one, um, we always want to identify the most accurate diagnosis possible. And if, as time goes on in the patient's relationship with the doctor, more data emerges, more findings, more observations emerge that shift the doctor's diagnostic thinking in a different direction. Uh, And if ultimately the patient is um, identified to have another diagnosis that even better accounts for all of what has gone on in the patient, then and in that case, maybe the mast cell activation really is a secondary issue. Well, well, that's great. Then, then switch to treating the more accurate diagnosis. Uh, but otherwise, if a more accurate diagnosis has not been clearly identified, uh, then perhaps what's needed at that point is a second opinion. I mean, there's n- I don't think there's ever a problem with getting a second opinion. Again, I realize the challenges some patients face in actually getting a second opinion, but but in general, there there's never a, a reason to uh, avoid getting a second opinion if questions have arisen as to the accuracy of the diagnosis. Treatment follows, the the most effective treatment almost always is going to follow from the most accurate diagnosis. So patients and their doctors should always be on the alert to pursue whatever should be pursued to pin down the most accurate diagnosis. No, I completely agree um, with your statement. and And I would say that as far as um, supporting uh, these uh, practitioners who are in this in this position where they're they're confused uh, by the case, or for patients who feel that the practitioner is confused, yes, absolutely, there has to be um, a second opinion either by the patient going somewhere else or those practitioners 
can reach out to Dr. Afrin or myself. Um, we're happy to help educate. I mean, that's our that's our mission is to educate more doctors, more practitioners, so that they can treat these patients themselves. I mean, we obviously can't see everybody. So we are happy to help in any way that we can. But I think it's always important to for for the patient to be confident in the care that they're getting and that they're they feel that they're being listened to. And so if the doctor is discrediting some of what they've they've been going through and, you know, um, giving them uh, some some um, difficulty in terms of moving to the next step of treatment, then you know the patient has to advocate for themselves and 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 find somebody else. But that's the challenge. Where do those patients go? And many of these patients don't have other resources in the areas there where they are, um, which is why we love to educate patients as well, and that's why we do podcasts like this to help them maybe do some research and find somebody who can help them um, out of out of state or out of the area, at least to get them on the right track, not for treatment purposes, because doctors out of the area can't treat them, but maybe to just help direct them to where they need to go. It's complicated. It's, it's so, it's so complicated, but I, I always get, uh, always feel that this is a very disconcerting situation that patients, um, and doctors are in when they're in this situation where they're not sure of the diagnosis. You yeah, know, that's great and really sure valuable information for especially the patient that seems a little bit lost, even when they are in good care. Um, but again, seeking out that original diagnosis, I think that's really great information from you both. Thank you. And yeah, a huge thank you for both of, to both of you for all of your work in this field. Uh, we, we both think that it's really helped to validate and change and improve the lives for so many out there, countless people that we've come across. So uh, when you have these really complicated issues, having the best, most knowledgeable care is, is obviously of utmost importance. And since we really believe in the two of you, what's the best way that people can reach either of you or follow along or contact you is Um, so, so first, I'll mention um, you know our website for now. Until we um, we are in the middle midst of changing the name of our practice, building a new practice, and we'll have a new website. But for now, they can get a lot of information. They can read our blogs um, on drtanyademsey.com, um, and then the Facebook page, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, and we we post all our podcasts and webinars and uh, Facebook Live events. Um, there, so there's always that uh, ability to to learn and and, and um, read our stuff, read and watch our stuff. Um, and in addition, um, they can reach us at the office. Our email in the office is info at armonkmed.com. Um, they're welcome to reach out uh, if they're interested in learning more about our practice. They can reach out to see how they can connect us with. Um, with their physicians. Again, we're happy to consult um, with their physicians on their cases without us being, we can't, um, we can't work with patients directly unless they're our patient, but we can help the, the practitioners. Um, and so that, I think those would be the, you know, the best ways to reach us. I'm, am I missing anything, Dr. Afrin? Um. No, it, I think it comes down to the web Amazing. and email. Well, Dr. Or, Dempsey, Dr. Afrin, thank you so much for taking the, office. Uh, the time out of your busy schedule and hope you have a great rest of 2019 here. And uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And listening to Thriving with Stripes. To follow along our journey, click the subscribe button on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found this podcast. To connect with us, go to our website at elevationwellness.co. We're also on Facebook as Elevation Wellness and on Instagram under the handle elevation underscore wellness underscore co. Until next time, zebras.